Hello everyone, welcome to this presentation. In this presentation, we will be talking about some open source research projects at Facebook. And we'll be talking about two projects in detail. One is building model evaluation pipeline and the other multitask reinforcement learning. So in today's agenda, I will first give you an introduction to the open source research projects at Facebook. And then I will be talking about our work on model evaluation pipeline. And then Shagun will be giving an introduction to their work on multitask reinforcement learning. Um, so when you think about open source research project at Facebook, what do you think of? So if you just simply go to GitHub, go to Facebook research, uh, you will see a whole bunch of awesome repositories on there. Um, you will also see there are a whole bunch of awesome people working on this. So we always try to open source our code on the research so that people can easily reproduce this. And we believe this is great for the advances of the fields. So we just uh, to give an idea, uh, I've tried to pull these popular open source repos from FAIR on GitHub, simply rank them by the number of stars. This is by no means an um, uh, an exhaustive list, um, but just to give you an idea. And you may have been familiar with some of them or actually all of these uh, frameworks. So when we look at these frameworks, they also cover various research domains, uh, such as natural language processing, uh, computer vision, reinforcement learning, uh, deep learning, um, and some toolkits for people to run experiments. Um, so as you see, there is a torch serve in this deep learning framework, which is also what I'll be talking about uh, in our project as well. So um, if um, you want to know more about open source at Facebook, definitely check out opensource.facebook.com to get more information. Next, I will be talking about our project on DynaBoard and DynaLab. So this is specifically about building a state-of-the-art model evaluation pipeline using open source Python toolkits. First of all, let me motivate um, the reason behind this project. So as we all know, there are multiple benchmarks in the market, uh, which are very important components uh, for the research community to compare performance and make advances. However, there are also known problems to these benchmarks. Here is a plot of a comparison of the performance reported on this benchmark versus the estimated human performance. As you can see, at first it took the research community decades to actually reach the human performance, but then very quickly, these models have beaten the human performance on these benchmarks. But does that mean we have solved the problems? It's probably no. So what has gone wrong? One obvious reason is that the datasets on these existing benchmarks are static, which means they don't evolve over time, and they may have contained bias from the beginning. But what's uh, worse is that because various people in the research community are trying to optimize the performance specifically on this set of benchmark datasets, very quickly we're going to overfit on this set of datasets. That's when we see we have beaten humans specifically on these datasets, but in general, we're probably not there yet. So how did we try to solve this problem? DynaBench was proposed to tackle this problem. And DynaBench is the platform for dynamic data collection and benchmarking. The main idea is that the models are hosted as an endpoint and we're encouraging human to talk to the model to try to propose examples that fool the models. And in this way, um, we call human model in the loop. Uh, the human is constantly generating new data, which fools the model. And then we train these models on this new adversarial data to have a new round of better models. And we continue this process to continually improve the model and get those data that fool the model. So now we are constantly getting new data. What do we do with the benchmarks? In the traditional benchmark, people normally just submit predictions 
or even self-report the metrics to that benchmark. And now once we've got the new data, um, it just becomes unscalable for people to constantly submit these predictions to the benchmark. So what do we do? We have done this evaluation as a service. The main idea is that instead of asking people to submit predictions, we now ask people to submit their model code. And then we run their models on all the currently existing popular datasets. And whenever new datasets come in, we can constantly update this performance by running this model code. The whole thing becomes automatic in our uh, service, which is called Evaluation Cloud, that uh, I will introduce very soon. And then we're having a constantly evolving benchmark that will not saturate. But we also have a bonus point here. Because we are running the code to get inference, we can now actually report more metrics than those performance and we can evaluate models from multiple perspectives. So on the right is a screenshot, uh, which you will get by submitting your model code to Dynabench. Um, so there are two types of datasets here. One is the leaderboard datasets that will actually be used to report performance and compare with other models. But you also get this non-leaderboard datasets uh, where we will just report the metrics um, to give you an idea. So currently, there are four tasks on Dynabench, uh, including natural language inference, question answering, sentiment analysis, and hate speech. And there are multiple datasets associated with each task, which means whenever you submit a model, you get the metrics on all these datasets hassle-free. And that brings us to Dynaboard. Um, here is a quick screenshot of Dynaboard on, on natural language inference task. There are currently six models submitted there. And you see, uh, for each model, we are reporting not only accuracy, but also compute, which is the inference speed, and memory utilization during this inference, and then fairness and robustness. Um, there is also a new thing called Dynascore, which we use to rank the models. I will talk about these metrics in more detail. But first of all, let's have a look at how this evaluation as a service system works in an overview. So let's start from a user's perspective. Um, everything starts with this DynaLab, which is a command line tool for people to submit their model code to Dynabench. And once people submit their model code, what's happening is that these models will go into our build server, which have a model deployer to create these endpoints. Um, it should be noted that most of this is uh, is hosted on the AWS. So what this model deployer does is that it will create an AWS SageMaker model and the endpoint for this model. So the two main methods in this deployer is the deployment and cleanup. Cleanup means if we fail uh, to deploy a model, we're just going to clean up everything. And then once a model is deployed, um, we will talk to this um, Evaluation Cloud using AWS SQS uh, to send uh, the message. And this message is mainly the model ID in our database. This Evaluation Cloud has a main component called Requester to um, actually process all the requests of evaluations, whether it's evaluate a model on the dataset, or evaluate a model on all datasets, or evaluate the dataset on all models. There are also two main components in this requester. One is the job scheduler, uh, whose idea is very similar to Slurm, if you are familiar with Cluster. Um, this is used to run batch transform jobs on AWS um, SageMaker and keep track of those things. And there is a metrics computer, um, which takes the output from the transform jobs and compute the metrics, as the ones we've seen in the Dynaboard. The major resources on this evaluation cloud are the datasets and the metrics. And once the evaluation is done from the evaluation cloud, um, the results are written into the database, and that's where the user can see from the Dynaboard. So how does this whole thing work in detail? Let me give a step-by-step -step breakdown. So again, starting from a user's perspective, let's say you have a bird model. When we say you have some model locally, um, this normally refers to some files. 
So apparently checkpoint is an important component, which is your actual model. And then there is a handler, um, which is required by TorchServe, the tool that we use to serve the, the open source toolkit we use to, uh, uh, to serve the models. And this is also developed at Facebook. Um, the handlers, uh, they normally and it, I, I use to define, uh, to process the input and uh, give the output. So basically defines how your model does the inference. And we'll talk a bit more about this later. And then there may be a requirements file, uh, which basically says what other dependencies your model, is, your model needs to run the inference correctly. And then we use the DynaLab command line tool to upload this model into our build server, which will deploy the model onto AWS endpoint. Um, so what happens specifically here in the deployment stage is that uh, we use TorchServe to create a model server um, inside a Docker container, uh, which forms an isolated environment for your model to uh, be served and run the inference. And this Docker is hosted on AWS SageMaker to create that endpoint. And immediately what you can do is to talk to your model uh, which basically means talk to this endpoint via our create interface. And this create interface is the one we just show in the Dynabench. That's what people use to talk to the models to uh, generate those data that fool the model uh, for data collection. And now once we have deployed the model, um, the evaluation will come in. Um, so what happens is that uh, let's first have a look at this evaluation cloud. The main results on the evaluation, as I mentioned, are datasets and metrics. And here we first give an overview of the datasets. The datasets on the evaluation server is organized by tasks. And currently there are four tasks on the evaluation server. They are question answering, um, hate speech, natural language inference, and sentiment. Um, here I'm using question answering as an example to illustrate how the whole thing works. So there are two types of datasets on evaluation cloud. Uh, one is uploaded by task owners. Um, these include the rounds data, as we mentioned, collected natively on Dynabench, and these are the adversarial data um, that has full model. And then there are also external popular datasets, such as Squad and Hopout QA. There are more, but these are just like a couple to give an example. And then um, we generate some perturbed datasets based on heuristics to review the fairness and robustness side of models because we think these are very important things that people often overlook in the current benchmark. Um, so how are these generated? Um, these are basic generated post hoc. Um, in fairness, we're doing some uh, perturbations such as uh, swapping the gender of words uh, changing ethnicity, uh, changing location, and robustness. We mainly look at things like misspell, um, for, such as like uh, keyboard type error and OCR type of error. And these datasets, they're all securely saved on AWS S3 and no one can access them. And that is to ensure the confidentiality of the datasets so that peop uh, people are all on the fair ground to uh, submit their models and run the evaluations. And now comes the metrics part, which basically how does this evaluation work? So when a model is submitted into the evaluation cloud, we will trigger the evaluations. The model will be evaluated on all the existing datasets, specifically the existing uploaded datasets. And when we run the models on these original datasets, um, we get a set of predictions, and by comparing the prediction and the label, we get the performance metric. Specifically in question answering, we use F1 as the metric, but in other tasks like uh, natural language inference, accuracy is the one that is used. And then we also set fairness and robustness are important aspects of the model, so how do we evaluate this? Uh, similarly, we run our model on these perturbed datasets to get a new set of predictions. And we compare this new set of predictions against the original prediction that we get on the unperturbed data. And we compute the percentage of unperturbed predictions, um, which is used as a measurement of the fairness and robustness of model. 
Apparently, this may not be the best way to do things, and we're never saying this is the best way. But、um, as as the first version of things, we we think these can、uh, to some extent review these aspects, and we definitely encourage the research community to propose better methods to be incorporated here. And as I mentioned before, because we are running the evaluation code, we can actually have this efficiency metrics such as compute, which is the inference speed. And the memory utilization、um, during these inference jobs, and this can be important for people if you care about how fast your model runs, what kind of re- resource your model needs to run inference, and these are not available in traditional benchmark if people are just submitting predictions. But now we can do it. So that is the rough idea.、Uh, I've explained the metrics part. There are various performance metrics such as accuracy F1. There are efficiency metrics such as compute and memory, and we also try to tackle fairness and robustness. And then there is a Dyna score, which is the overall score that we use to rank the models. And the way the Dyna score is computed, because we're now in a multi-metric setup, we are computing the average marginal rate of substitution (AMRS). At which your model creator trade off fairness, robustness, compute, and memory for one point increase in the performance. And、um, there is there is two setup here.、Uh, one is a default setup, which is the default weighting to each metric, and that is、uh, where we convert the metrics using the respective AMRS and the average. And then we also allow users to specify their own weights. That is to say, what is important to the user, and using their own ways to calculate the Dyna score, so that they you can create your own Dyna board according to what you need, and say this is the model that best suits my need. So let's look at a demo of how Dyna board works. Give a quick demo of how Dyna board work. This is a typical leaderboard you'll see from Dyna board, and the current task can. Uh, looking at is natural language inference.、Um, so from the model column, you see there are currently six models submitted to this leaderboard, and there are five metrics as we have discussed, and this overall Dyna score.、Um, these metrics next to each model are the aggregated metrics on datasets, and if you want to see a breakdown upon datasets, you can click this triangle and see the scores here. You should bear in mind that any metrics associated with dataset themselves are like the basic metrics, and they are the foundation、um, to compute aggregated metrics and the Dyna score. And now there are two things you can do to choose a model according to your needs. You can either tune the metric weight or the dataset weight. So if we click this button on metric weights, we'll see the sliders. Under each metric name, so by default we're assigning the highest weight on accuracy, which is a close setup to traditional benchmarks. And now let's say if you really want a model that do inference very fast, then you want to increase the weight on this compute.、Um, so before we move this, let's take a note: the current best model is Dberta, and the current best Dyna score is forty three point sixty. As we move this slider, we're changing the weight on metrics, and that will change the Dyna score, which is aggregated on the overall metrics. Now let's move this slider, and I move as I move it. You should see there is a change on the Dyna score, and as I continue to increase this weight, you see finally Roberta becomes the best model under your current、uh, criterion. Uh, we can also change the dataset weight by click this dataset button. And currently, we're assigning equal weight to all of the datasets by default. And let's say if I really don't care about this performance on this runs dataset, I can decrease the weight of them. And as I change the dataset weight, I'm going to affect this overall metric, which is computed by aggregating datasets. And the change of this Aggregated metrics will in turn change the Dyna score. So let's see what will happen. Let's move this round one slider first. You should see the metric numbers they are changing for each model, and similarly the Dyna score is changing accordingly. 
And now let's say I'm going to reduce the weight on all these round data sets. And you see, in the end, this majority baseline becomes the best in this leaderboard. So after looking at the demo of Dynaboard, now you probably be wondering, oh, I have a model that is better than all of yours. How can I submit my model to enter that competition? And here is where Dynalab comes. Dynalab is the open source toolkit we've built um, to make your life easy for app model upload. And for a model upload, it's a simple three-step process, initialize, test, and upload. We also define task IO in Dynalab, which I'll be talking about later. So how does the model upload process work? Uh, first of all, you need to initialize a project repo. Um, you may all be very familiar with how you initialize a Git repo, and it is very similar um, here. So first of all, you uh, switch there into your project folder, fancy project, and from there, you call Dynalab Clean init and give your model a fancy name. What this will do is it will initialize this project folder for Dynalab model upload, which includes creating a project config that points to various files that we need to define your model. Um, specifically, we also need a handler, which is required by TorchServe, the open source toolkit developed at Facebook to serve uh, models. Um, and if you don't have a handler already, we will be creating a template for you to fill. I'll be talking a bit more about how to compose a handler file very soon. After you initialize the repo, now you need to test the code, assuming you have finished your handler. There are two tests uh, on offer in Dynalab. Uh, one is a local test. The other is called an integrated test. So in this local test, what we do is we will just mock test your model to check if the input and output are correct. So if your model is taking the input correctly and return an expected output. And then you need to run an integrated test where we will mock serving your model in the dot container, in the Docker container, to check if the dependencies are correct, if you are importing things correct, if you've included everything you need to serve this model in an isolated Docker container. And then um, if everything is good, you pass the test, you can now upload the model. This is a simple command, upload. What this will do is to create a tarball for your current project folder and it will upload the tarball into our uh, build server for deployment. So as you can see in this three-step process, um, you're just still working in your project folder, but um, the only thing that may be very relevant um, or like uh, include a bit of work is the handler. That's a bit of extra code you need to write. Um, so here is an example or explanation of how this handler works. Um, because we're creating model server using TorchServe, uh, TorchServe is requiring a model handler um, to basically understand how does your model process input and output. So this is a typical handler class. Um, and there are typically four methods in this handler. One is initialize, where you will load and configure the model. And then preprocess, where you take the input data and parse that. For example, our input data is usually a JSON object, and you need to pass the various attributes. And in some toolkits, you also want to like binarize your data. Like especially in NLP, um, you need to check with the dictionary and convert those uh, tokens into the index. And then do the inference where you will run the model prediction and then the post-process method to assemble the actual response you will return to TorchServe. And when TorchServe interacts with your model, the entry function is this handle function. In this handle function, um, you will get a data and a context from TorchServe. And this context is something like a system property, uh, things including where the uh, checkpoint is saved, um, what is the device, is there GPU available or not, what is the batch size, things like that. And then in this handle function, you'll basically be using your handler to pre-process the data, run the inference, post-process the data, and return the response. So that's still very simple, right? 
Um, and then last thing, as we said, is the task I/O in Dynalab. Um, so you probably have been familiar that uh, on our evaluation cloud, uh, data sets are organized by tasks. Because we're running the model on all these data sets, basically we're expecting that all data sets follow exactly the same input format and your model return exactly the same output format for the evaluation cloud to compute metrics. So how are these defined? Uh, these are defined in Danalab. So the input is defined simply by simply specify an example. So let's take question answer as an example again. Uh, so you provide an example in the question answering file, which will have a qu context and a question. And that is to say all the data sets um, in question answering task will be following this format. And for the response we expect from the model output, we define a method called verify response, where um, the response from that model will simply need to pass all these checks. So this code is basically saying your response needs to have the answer field. And this answer field must be something extracted from this context field, because this is extractive QA. Um, so that is basically um, how Dynalab works. Um, and in the end, uh, I'd like to thank my team. So we are a very big team and um, it's just impossible to list everyone here. So here is just part of the team and in random order. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for uh, listening to this. And next, Shagun will be talking about their work on multitask reinforcement learning. Hello everyone, I'm Shagun. I'm a research engineer with Facebook AI Research, and I will be talking about some recent work that we open sourced related to multitask reinforcement learning. I will start by talking a little bit about reinforcement learning to make sure everyone is on the same page. And I will take the example of playing the game of chess. So when I'm playing chess, there's this opponent and there's a board between us. And I look at the board, I observe the board and looking at the state of the board, I come up with a move and I play that move on the board and then it's my opponent's turn and then they play their move and so on. And every time that I'm playing the move, I do not know what the best action to take is. I have a rough sense of some actions that may be useful and some actions that may not be useful, but beyond that, I do not know what the perfect action is at any point of time. And every once in a while, uh, maybe I capture a piece from my opponent or my opponent captures a piece of mine, which gives me a, some sort of reinforcement or some sort of reward, or it gives them some sort of reward. There is this notion of interaction and we do not know what the best move is or what, what is the best action is at any point of time. And then there's this notion of rewards or some sort of signal which says, yes, you did, did something right or something something wrong. Uh, these, these are some of the key characteristics of a reinforcement learning problem. And to formalize this a little bit more, uh, when I said that, hey, I'm playing the game of chess, so then I am sort of an agent and my opponent, the board and everything else becomes part of the environment. And when I look at the board and I observe the board, uh, I'm basically accessing the state. So I, I see the state um, and given the state, I come up with a move, which is the action. So I look at the board, I look at the state and I say, okay, so this is what I'm going to do. So I play that action which is equivalent to you know interacting with the environment in the reinforcement learning sense and the environment gives me a new state so so i take a move and my opponent takes a move and then i say oh okay so this is not how the board looks like now and every once in a while maybe i capture their piece they capture my piece there's some sort of reward that we are getting and at the end there's a winner so this is this is what a standard reinforcement learning problem looks like now the chess example may look a bit simplistic, but a lot of real life problems can be mapped to reinforcement learning problems and can be solved using reinforcement learning algorithms. But all this is single task reinforcement learning. For example, when we are learning to play chess, we are learning to just play chess. A multitask version would be where we are trying to play 10 different games or 50 different games at once. So the next question is, why should we build environments and baselines for multitask RL? And as I said, a lot of real life problems can be mapped to reinforcement learning problems. And if we know how to solve those reinforcement learning problems, we can solve the underlying problems. Uh, for some time, multitask reinforcement learning problems were mostly of academic interest. So researchers would be the ones who would be hearing about it. But now more and more people, more engineers, more practitioners are becoming interested in it. So it has become a even more important problem to work on. 
The second aspect is the ease of use. So if someone in the audience develops an environment and I want to use that environment, it should be easy for me to do that. I should not have to rewrite a lot of things or I should not have to copy paste a lot of things just to, to play with the environment. And the same goes for the agent. So if I develop an agent, it should be easy for others to use that agent for their own workflows. Now looking back at this picture, there are two main components. There's an agent and there's an environment. And these two components are the same for a multitask RL code base as well. So there would be multitask RL environments and multitask RL algorithms. And we open source two different libraries, each catering to one of the use cases. The first library that we open source is called MTN, multitask environments. The goal of multitask environments or MTN is to standardize multitask RL environments and to provide better benchmarks. What does standardization mean? I'll take an example. OpenAI Gym, it's a very popular Python library. It provides the most popular interface for RL environments. And I'm just going to show how that interface looks like in practice. So we start by importing the gym module, and then we make an environment called a Scott pool. And beyond this, the logic or the interface would remain exactly the same. So we have the environment, we reset the environment, we get an observation. We're going to step to the environment a thousand times, and we have a policy. Policy job is just to give me the action given, a, uh, given an observation. It's not part of the environment. So given the action, we step the, we step through the environment and we get an observation, we get some reward signal, we get a Boolean flag done, which says whether we have completed the task or not, and we get an info dictionary. And if we have completed a task, that is if done is equal to true, we just reset the environment and we get a new observation. And at the end, we just close the environment. So, uh, so this is what the interface looks like in practice. And the biggest benefit of this interface is the standardization. The, the training loop becomes very standardized. And it's very easy to swap out the agent. It's very easy to change the environment. We don't have to worry about these things. The, the loop remains, the interface remains the same. Now, the problem is Jim is not designed to control the task state. And task information is not a first class citizen. Now, this does not mean you cannot support it. Yes, you can. In fact, you can support the task information in multiple ways. And that is precisely the problem. Because when you have multiple ways of doing something, you lose the standardization. And the moment you lose the standardization, now there's additional app overhead for using other people's environment. There's additional overhead for using uh, other people's implementation, which discourages researchers or people from uh, working with other people's environments. This is the precise problem that we are trying to solve. We are trying to provide a standardized interface for multitask RL, just like OpenAGM provides for single task. So we extend their API to support multiple tasks with two guiding principles. One is that we want to make minimal changes to the gym interface because the community is very familiar with that. We do not want to break that. And we want to make it easy to port the existing environments to MTN so that the adoption is easy for people. The, from the user's perspective, the biggest change is that Jim used to return an unstructured observation, whereas MTN would return a structured observation. So it would return a dictionary, which has two keys, an environment observation and a task observation. So this loop, this interface would remain exactly the same. It's just that the observation would now become a dictionary instead of being a, a unstructured object. Uh, so yeah, so the change to the environment interface is quite minimal. Now, from the perspective of the developer of the environments, there are some more changes. Support task information as a first class citizen. So a task information would have its own separate seed, its own observation space, and so on, which makes it easier to control a task state. But at the same time, it means that the environment designer has to write a few extra methods. Uh, but to make their lives easier, uh, if they already have a multitask environment that they want to port to MTN, we provide several wrappers to help with that part. So, so the amount of work that they have to do is minimized. As of now, we support seven different environments. Some of them are deployed by us. Some of them are already existing multitask environments, and we just wrote wrappers to port them. Going forward, we want to add more environments. We want to add more benchmarks, and we want to extend the library. For example, capabilities like handling variable action and observation spaces. The library is available on PyAPI, and the code is also open sourced. Coming to the second part, which is MTRL, which is the MT, the multitask RL algorithms. Uh, this library is implemented as a collection of modules. And at a high level, there are two main modules. There is a base policy or a single task policy, single task RL policy. And then we have some sort of plug and play components that would start with the base policy. And they would make that policy work on the multitask setup. 
In terms of the base policy, I'm not going to describe what these are, but they, these are the six basic components that we support. And using these six basic components, we can implement these three popular single task policies. On the multitask RL side, we support for family of uh, multitask RL components. So there are task or context encoders, there are gradient manipulation algorithms, there are task specific components like multi headed policies, and there are centralized policies. Now, instead of describing what these different algorithms mean, I'm just going to show examples of how these are combined in practice. So let's say uh, I'm training on an environment. I want to be using the actor, critic, encoder, and decoder as a base policy component. So I want a policy which has these four components. And for the multitask RL component, I want to be using multi-headed policies. So this is how the different arguments would look like when I want to train the system. Uh, the first line is basically setting up the standard Python setup. Uh, in the next case, I am set, saying that, hey, I want to use MetaWorld, and specifically in MetaWorld, I want to use MT10. So MetaWorld is a collection of environments. It has two flavors, MT10, which has 10 environments, MT50, which has 50 environments. And then I'm saying I want to use a state SAC agent. A state SAC agent is the agent which uses all these four components. It's specified via config. And in terms of the multitask RL policy, I'm saying, hey, I want to be using multi-headed policies. So I basically assemble these components via the arguments, and I can train the system. Now, instead of using multitask RL components, let's say I wanted to use mixture of encoders. So then uh, I'll, I'll write something similar to what I was writing earlier, but I would use I, I would specify that agent.encoder.type to select is MOE. MOE stands for mixture of encoders. Just to contrast this with what we wrote earlier, the top three lines were exactly the same, only the multitask RL components were different. Now, as I said earlier, these are all plug and play components. So there's nothing stopping me from using both the mixture of encoders and the multi-headed policy at once. So I could I could specify both of them uh, as part of the arguments when training the system, and the agent would have both these components. Now, this is a very powerful thing because what it means is if we were to add a new base component or a new multitask RL component, that would work with all other existing components, which means if I was to add a new base policy, I would also be adding a lot of multitask RL policies uh, because that new policy can be combined with all the existing multitask RL components as and how we like. Just to take a few more examples, let's say I'm training with mixture of encoders, but I want to specifically use only four encoders. In that case, I can specify the number of encoders. And let's say I want to train the mixture of encoders, but instead of training it on MT10, I want to train it on MT50. So everything remains the same. I just change the name of the environment. So even though environment is not implemented as part of MTRL code, environment is a separate implementation. It's a separate repository. Uh, even the environment is very plug and play here. And this goes back to what we said in the start that we want to increase the ease of use. So it doesn't matter who has implemented the environment. It does not matter who has implemented the specific uh, component that you are using. You can assemble these and you can create new agents. MTRL code is also open sourced on this URL. In terms of future steps, we want to add more base policies and components, and we want to scale the system and make it easier to use. So for example, more, efficient, more memory efficient replay buffers or more examples of complex pipelines or providing pre-trained weights and models. With that, I thank you all. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you.